All right, so we've got T jump, we've got Mal Alex Malpass. I almost said Malex Alpass, and uh, they're going to have it out on Tom's moral system. It's not moderated; no one else can talk. It's just these guys. And with that, I'll uh, pass it off to you. Okay. Hi, Tom. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Am I loud and clear? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay, maybe we've got a bit of a delay. I don't know. You seem like it's a bit of a delay after me speaking that you speak. I'm clicking to different windows, so I have to click back and then press the button to do the talk to chat then. Okay. So, I mean, do you want to start, I guess? I mean, we're talking about your moral theory, I suppose. Uh, sure. So I believe in an objective morality, um, which means I believe it's true independent of human minds or refers to something independent of human minds. Kind of like if it's a law of nature, the truth is contingent on whether or not it describes the law. And so it doesn't matter uh, what people's opinions are. And that's why, as Ask Yourself was asking me, why can't a relativist agree to this model? Is because it refers to something in reality, not to minds. And so they couldn't agree to that and still be a relativist. Okay, that's that. So far, that's fair enough. I don't think I have any real problem with that. I'm quite sympathetic to something like a realist view myself, so that seems fine. So I think the well, what what seemed to me was your 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 definition of morality, right? You have a um something about morality being or something. Here, let me see if this is right. Um, you say that an action is immoral when it's um, an involuntary imposition on somebody. And so the best of all possible worlds is the one where there are no involuntary impositions on anybody. Is that right? Yes. Yep, that's correct. Okay, so did you read the blog post that I wrote? Um, part of it, I think. I don't think I read the whole thing. Okay, so... Um, to me, that um, that definition, I mean, if it has weird consequences, I suppose. So when, when I started thinking about what, what would you classify as being immoral on this theory, and do I think that any of those things, do I think it's misfiring and calling the wrong thing immoral? Because I guess, you know, there are things that are obviously immoral, right? Kind of folk theory of what's immoral and what's not, um, which are impositions on will. Like um, if you steal from someone, then you're taking stuff and they don't want you to do that. So obviously there's something um, connected. Or if you rape someone, or if you kill someone, whatever, you can imagine there's some element of like imposing upon their will about that. Um, so it does overlap to some extent with the concept of morality, it seems to me. Um, but there are cases where it seems like it's giving the wrong answer. So <clears throat> I think it depends exactly what you mean by something being immoral, uh, sorry, by it being involuntary. Um, but if something's involuntary when you haven't actively consented to it happening, then something like a surprise birthday party, right? So if I throw a surprise birthday party for you and I don't tell you about it in advance, then obviously you haven't consented to it happening. Um, I, you know, I come up with some ruse, lead you into the, the room of some house and you're not expecting it, and then all of our friends are there and they say happy birthday or whatever, right? Now that's an imposition on your will in the sense that, um, well, it's involuntary in the sense that you haven't volunteered for that to happen. You haven't actively given your consent for that to happen. So in oh. that sense of involuntary, it's an imp involuntary imposition upon you, but it's not immoral, right? So it doesn't seem like, although sometimes it's classifying the right things as immoral, sometimes it's classifying the wrong things as immoral. So it doesn't seem to me like it's tracking um, the concept of morality very well there. Right. Do you see right. So you I wouldn't I wouldn't classify that as an involuntary imposition of will because it's not imposing on the will of the person. It's not restricting their will or doing anything that they wouldn't consent to. So I wouldn't classify that as an involuntary imposition of will, even if though it is involuntary. So but okay, so I'm trying to become clearer about what it means to be involuntary, I suppose. And so what I'm saying is that it can't just be that something that someone hasn't um, consented to, because in that case, that is something that you haven't consented to. Okay, right? let me so let me clarify that a little bit. Would so, consent to. so 
in that would be involuntary. They did not voluntarily agree to go to the birthday party, but it wouldn't be an imposition on their will. So an imposition on their will means something that restricts their will or stops them from doing something that prevents them from achieving a goal. So it's some way that hinders their will in some way or hinders their goals or their values or something like that. Okay, so then, I mean, and now let's take a different example then. Like, let's say... Um, that I'm sitting on the train tracks playing with my Lego set, right? And I'm building a big castle. And at that point, my goal is to build the castle with my Lego set. Um, but there's a train coming towards me and I'm unaware of that. You run over and push me out of the way, right? Saving my life. But you've interrupted my plan um, and thwarted my will at that point. But that's not immoral, right? You saved my life. Uh, no, I would classify that as immoral. Um, put it in the context of... If we imagine we lived in the best of all possible worlds, the example I use, then it would be impossible for the train to hurt you in any way. And so me pushing you would just be me pushing you for no reason. And so it would be an immoral imposition of will. The only reason it's not immoral in the context of the example you used is because there's a natural justification. I have to do, there's something's coming that's going to cause a greater imposition of will if I don't push you. So my pushing you is still immoral because it's an involuntary imposition of your will, but it's justified because it prevents a greater immorality, which is the train hitting you. But I would still classify that as immoral. Well, uh, so I'm, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering whether, um, I mean, so to me, the, the case of altruistically risking your life to save someone in that sense, pushing them out of the way of a train, um, if that's immoral, I, I just feel like your concept of what's moral and what's immoral isn't tracking, because that seems like a paradigmatically, I mean, I'm not sure what we're supposed to be talking about. If that's immoral, saving your life in that situation, I don't know whether we mean the same thing by moral then. I mean, I, I just think you're tracking a different concept at that point. Right? I, I just am not sure why we would call that morality anymore. Uh, so it, it's immoral in the sense that you push somebody, but it's moral in the sense that you save their lives. So it's two independent actions there. One you imposed on them, but one the other is you also save them. So it's in my model, you have to put it in the context of the best of all possible worlds to understand what objective morality is. The fact that it's pragmatic to do something or that it leads to a better um, outcome in that one situation doesn't give you a, an accurate description of what objective morality is. So I grant that it's pragmatic to do that. It's best in the given situation, but there's still some level of immorality there. Like if you said killing baby Hitler to save 6 million Jews, I would say that is the correct decision, but it's still immoral to kill baby Hitler. You're still killing someone. So in my context, doing any involuntary imposition of will is in some sense immoral, but it can still be justified in pragmatic context to prevent a greater immorality. Yeah, I, I'm not. So I think, look, let me try and back up a bit. So I think if you try and, so, I mean, I could just define, I mean, I could just make a definition, right? And just say, um, morality is my left foot, right? So um, anything that's my left foot is moral and anything that isn't my left foot is immoral, right? There you go. It's a definition. Um, and, but then, you know, someone will say, well, what about like giving money to charity? And I'll say, it's not my left foot, so it's immoral, right? And it just seems like, well, I've come up with a definition, all right? And I could use the word morality, but I think any reasonable person would look at that and say, um, I'm not, you know, it's not a plausible candidate for what we mean when we say morality, like what we actually care about. Um, there's a concept that has a usage already, an attempt to classify and sort of refine and elucidate what that concept is it just fails if if the definition is that it's my left foot right that's just wrong right so i take it that that i mean i take you agree with me at least at this far i mean hopefully you do yeah yeah but my goal here is like if you push someone down just take the one example you used and get rid of the train just pushing someone down is obviously immoral like there's no moral justification for that if you're just pushing someone down for no reason so that action on its own it should be be clearly an immoral action. Adding the train doesn't make it moral. It just makes it that it's an immoral action to prevent a greater immoral action. It's still immoral to push someone down. Like given any possible situation, you shouldn't push people down. Does that make sense? Um, 
Uh, it sort of does. I mean, I'm not sure that <laughs> I, it feels strange to sort of atomize the actions into their parts like that. I mean, I mean, like pushing is wrong. I mean, pushing someone into a train is wrong. Pushing someone out the ray of a train is right. Um, and pushing absent any context whatsoever, does, I, I'm not sure how to evaluate that. I mean, it feels weird to just say pushing is wrong, right? And then and then only after that way up against some other kind of element of the context. It just feels weird. I mean, is moving my hands in that way wrong? Um, no, they're just hand movements, right? Like, I mean, I don't know. I, you wouldn't want to break it down further, more atomized than a push. But oh, right, know, right. Um, I, want to, I want to think of the action as pushing out of the way of a train, right? That's the action. Um, but you're breaking it in half and saying one of them is a push and the other one is like, you know, I don't know, moving out the way of a train or something. One of them is bad and the other one's, well, what's the other? No, sorry, I guess I misunderstand. The pushing is bad, but the leaving um, them there would be worse. Is that well, what you're let, me, let me clarify. So it's any involuntary imposition of will is the criterion that I break it down with. So if you want to build a castle and someone pushes you without your consent, you have imposed on their will. The pushing has imposed on their will. So that action is immoral. Now, if you don't push them and the train hits them, the train's going to impose on their will because they obviously don't want to die. So there's going to be an immoral action here, no matter what. So this person's will is going to be imposed upon. And you can, and I atomize that down to show that one of these, neither of these actions are, good in the best of all possible worlds neither of these would occur it's not good that this occurs it's not good that you're pushing them down it's just less bad that you're pushing them down i in suppose i'm thinking about it from i'm thinking about it from the point of view of the person standing there from your point of view i said i was the person playing with the lego and you're standing there watching right what should you do right you, you can either stand and watch or you can push me out of the way right one of those actions is is good and one of them's bad right well, yeah, I should push you out of the way, but that's not good. It's just less bad. In the best of all possible worlds, I would do neither. I would have to. I wouldn't have to do either. So it's still but bad because I'm I mean, still imposing on your will. Sure. In the best of all possible worlds, I mean, we come back to that concept in a minute. But but I mean, just because there's some other situation in which you wouldn't have to do that. I mean, you, let's just say you are in that situation. Um, it just seems like. I mean, uh, I'm wondering whether you can evaluate um, an action in a situation, whether you think that's actually possible, whether you have to refer to some idealized state of the best possible situation before you could evaluate whether or not pushing me out of the way was was right or wrong. I mean, is that your position? You, you have to refer to the best of all possible worlds to know how good that would be or something. And I'm just, I'm sort of not really getting this. It just seems really obvious that pushing someone out of the way to save their life is good. That should be a truism we start start with. I'm sort of puzzled why you don't think that's true. All right. So in my model, you have to look at it from the perspective of the best of all possible worlds. Now, I agree it's a net good to push someone out of the way, but it's still bad to push them. You shouldn't. You shouldn't have to do that. You're still imposing on their will. It's not like well, they want shouldn't to have to do it, but you should do it. You shouldn't have to and shouldn't do are two different concepts. Right, right. But that's only true given the pragmatic situation. So you do one immoral action to prevent a greater immoral action. The fact that you're saving their life is a greater good than pushing them out of the way is negating from them. So I agree you should do it, but it's not good. I, I like the killing baby Hitler example because it's more obvious. It's like Wait, if so you, you, kill think that you, you think that you should do things that are bad? Yes, if you only have options of a small bad and a big bad, you should do the small bad. So do the least bad thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I do. The, okay, so I think that there are times where you have to do the least bad thing. Um, voting sometimes is, feels a bit bad. <laughs> um, but th this isn't one of those cases. I mean, I'm saving your life. That isn't um, a least bad thing. It's just a good thing. I mean, I'm just not sure why it would be. Um, I, so and I, and when we say why is that a bad thing, you say because you shouldn't have to. And I feel like, well, shouldn't have to. You know, I shouldn't have to. I don't know. Uh, get dressed. I don't know. Maybe maybe I should be able to just walk around in my PJs and my dressing gown all the time. Right? Maybe I say I shouldn't have to get dressed or something. That's complete. That, that's not not a moral concept. I mean, like, um, I, I I just feel like you're switching topics then when you smuggling and should have to. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, we're talking about what you should do. Um, and in that situation, you, you sh I mean, maybe you shouldn't have to. It's, it's unlucky that you're in that situation where you 
you know, you feel like your obligation means that you should push someone out of the way and risk your life. And you, you might say, well, I shouldn't have to be in this situation. I wish there was someone else here that could do that. Or if that idiot hadn't been playing Lego on the train track, right? Then shouldn't have to be in a situation. What an idiot. Um, but that's not, you know, that's not a moral consideration. The thing is, you've got two things, two options in this scenario. One of them you should do and the other one you shouldn't do. And just saying, well, I shouldn't have to do it doesn't, I don't think, I don't see how that makes any difference to whether the thing is right or wrong, right? It's, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm, you see, to me, it doesn't feel like there's um, a calculation you can do to just say um, anything that's X is good and anything that's uh, Y is bad. I just don't feel that that type of algorithmic approach to morality is very plausible because what happens, you always end up um, uh, saying something weird, you know, some consequence you didn't think about. Um, when you came up with the algorithm in the first, not just you in particular, but people in general. Um, so what looks like a sort of plausible way of capturing what morality is ends up being um, implausible in the periphery cases, right? And you see similar sorts of things in philosophy of science around like scientific method or whatever. People don't just think there's some straightforward algorithm anymore, like, you know, falsification or something that's like, this is simple method that characterizes all and only science. So people don't just don't think that anymore in contemporary philosophy of physics. Um, and I think similar sort of things going on here with, with morality. It just doesn't seem like you can say like, anything that's an imposition of will is is bad. I mean, you can say that, of course, but then what happens is you end up um, saying things that are just weird, like pushing someone out of the way is just a paradigmatically good thing to do. But you have to come up, I mean, you, your theory is very uncomfortable. You have to start saying lots of weird, extra extraneous things to make sense out of just simply saying that that thing's good. I mean, we, we can pick a different example if you like, but I mean, it just, this is just one that seems particularly obvious to me that um, it's misfiring if it calls an act of altruistic life-saving bad. <laughs> and it seems right. like you're just going to bite the bullet and say that it, in some sense it is bad. Um, and that just feels like you know, any theory that has that consequence is, is kind of weird. Right? Don't All you right, think so it's me, weird? I, mean, just, if, I want to use that example and uh, let me see if I can explain to you and get you to agree with me on this. So I think it is there is like a, a model that we can use to describe this universally, essentially. So... If we look at the example you gave of someone building their castle on the tracks and a train is coming, um, it's immoral to push them out of the way because there is a more moral option. Like, for example, if I could uh, lift the train up and move it across the tracks and avoid you and the, the, the castle, and so the train is fine and you still get to build your castle, that's a more moral option than pushing you out of the way. Um, I mean, okay. well, I... So, but, <laughs> um, so if you were like, okay, so we want to change the scenario so that you're like Professor Magneto or whatever, and you can lift trains up. I mean, it, okay, if the, in that situation, the right thing to do is to lift the train out of the way. I mean, I was assuming that it's actually you. Right? Oh, right, right. But that's, you don't have ability. Right, so, that's kind of the thing I'm kind of leading into is that given all possibilities this possibility of pushing you out of way isn't the best option it's only the best given my pragmatic limitations that doesn't make it the best option it isn't moral to push you out of the way it's just the best given my limited situation so the reason it's immoral is because there's a moral option there i just don't have access to it the most moral option would be to let you build the castle and let the train go past and no one's will is imposed upon okay well look let's imagine we turn turn the other way around and i say you know I'm playing on the train tracks with my Legos and then you just stand there and watch the train like flatten me. And then someone taps you on the shoulder and says, gee, Tom, that was, that seems like a weird thing to do to like not even try and save him. Isn't that kind of the immoral thing to do? And you say, no, it's not the most immoral thing to do. Cause I could have like had magic powers that set him on fire just before the train hit. And that would have been even worse. Right. Um, I mean, I guess it, does that have any bearing on the moral evaluation of what you did? I don't think it does. I think that the, you know, pretend, magical powers doesn't make um, a bad action less bad or a good action less good. They've got nothing to do with it. Moral evaluations are made in actual everyday real scenarios, right? People actually do things. Doctors save people's lives. I don't know, war criminals kill people, stuff like that. And we don't, nobody cares about what would happen if they had magical powers. That, that's not part of what we care about when we make moral evaluations. So why are you bringing it in here? I mean, I'm just not sure why why that's relevant. 
Well, it's kind of like the example of putting a criminal in prison. Like people sometimes feel it's moral to put criminals in prison when really, no, we're just, they're kind of just victims of biology. We do it because we have to protect other people. It's not good to put people in prison. It's not good to kill bad guys. It's still an immoral action, but we do it because there's a pragmatic usage that prevents a greater immoral action. So I see everything in that kind of uh, situation where we do one thing which imposes on will, not because it's good or moral, it's just the least bad thing we can do. I mean, okay, so, well, it's not the most immoral thing we could do, so it's also good, right? I mean, why, why are you picking it to be just because it's not the best thing we could do, it's bad? It's also not the worst thing we could do. I mean, you could, I suppose you can think of a world where absolutely everything all the time is an imposition on your will. And that would be the worst of all possible worlds. Um, so any world where it's not like that um, is better than that. And anything that happens in that world is good uh, as a result of that. Does, is that right? Is that also part of your theory? That I mean, I'm struggling. I don't really understand how on your theory anything is good. What's the? I understand what you're saying when uh, a will is imposed upon, it's bad. But if a will is not imposed upon, is that good? I mean, so you say a rock falls off a cliff and it hits you on the head, that's bad because it's imposed on your will. Although that also seems weird because most people wouldn't consider um, a rock to be capable of moral actions or whatever. But I mean, okay. But if a rock falls and misses my head, is that morally good because it hasn't imposed on my will or... Is it only good if, if it hits me and I wanted it to hit me because it satisfied my will or something? I, I'm just not sure what right. good means on this theory. Yeah, so uh, if it doesn't impose on your will, then it's amoral. So it would be moral if it uh, assists your will. So if you want something and I help you get it, that would be moral. So if the rock misses you, that would be amoral. If the rock hits you, that would be more. Um, if you want it to hit you and it hits you, that would be moral. And if you don't want it to hit you and it hits you, that would be immoral. Yeah, so I, I mean, I just think that you're tracking a concept which is like desire satisfaction right and and you're just calling that and we could just agree that you've you're tracking a certain concept but i mean are you prepared so like look almost almost everybody else is going to say if a rock hits me on the head it's bad luck but it's not like immoral right almost everybody else is going to say that and you know that's a, that's a, an unusual thing to think Right, that it's sure. immoral, and not just un unlucky. Right. Um, so, what are you saying when people disagree with you? There are they wrong, or um, are they using the word to pick out a different concept altogether? I mean, are you talking about are they trying to say the same concept as you but failing, or are are they talking about something different from you when they say that that's not immoral? Like, what your concept obviously differs from kind of folk concept, the normal usage that people use so what's your diagnosis of that are they wrong or are you talking about two different things um i'm not sure the difference between those two but in the context i would say it is a strange inversion of reasoning to use like dan dennett's phrase i think that morality is a description of or should be a description of the best way the world could be not how people should specifically act but how the way the world should be and so it's immoral the rock is falling on you because the world would be a better place if that didn't happen Yeah, so my question was, so when people disagree with you, did, when someone says a rock hitting me on the head isn't immoral, it's just bad luck, do you think that they're factually incorrect? Or do you think, oh, he's using a different concept than me when he uses the term moral, right? Is that clear? Yeah, the difference between both. Well, I mean, yes. So I think there is an objective way to assess moral and immoral, and it's the way I'm using. So he would be incorrect to use that term, but the way he's using that term is in reference to a different definition of immorality. So both. It can't be both. If he's using, if he's referring to a different concept, like if I say, um, uh, I don't know, I'll meet you at the bank, right? And then I'm standing there next to the, the money place, right? And you're over there by the river, right? We've used the same word, bank, but we just had different concepts in mind, right? So it's it's not, you know, I'm, I'm using, um, but it's not that um, I was wrong. I just had a different concept in mind, two different meanings of the of the word bank. It just happened to have the same sort of sound that we use, but they're two completely different concepts, right? River bank and the place where the money comes from. 
right? Well, when you're talking about, when you say something's immoral and somebody says, well, a rock hitting me on the head isn't immoral, it's just bad luck, right? Do you think that they're like the person who's using a same, a word that sounds the same as yours, but just picks out a different concept there? And so in which case you're not really disagreeing, right? You know, like those two guys, one saying, I am at the bank, right? I mean, in a way they could both agree. Oh yeah, you are at the bank because you mean something different by bank, right? We're not actually disagreeing. But if you think you mean the same thing, then the guy standing by the river is just wrong because he's not standing by the money place, right? So you can't be both because in one case, one guy's factually incorrect because he's not standing by what you mean by the bank. In the other one, he isn't really disagreeing with me. He's just at what he means by the bank, right? So that you can't be both. Well, no, I still think it can be both. both. How could it be both? In that context, just think about the river bank and the money place. Let me me explain it. it So, So it's like in the case of gravity, we can say someone believes in Newtonian uh, mechanics and someone believes in um, general relativity. Uh, the person who believes in Newtonian mechanics is talking about a different thing. They're not talking about space time. Uh, Newton, Newton didn't know anything about bending space time. And so they are talking about a different concept of the idea of gravity and they're wrong. They are just Their equations do not correspond to reality. So they're talking about something different, but the general concept, they're two different competing models to explain the same general thing. So this guy who's talking about uh, the rock falling being immoral, he's still trying to give a competing theory of what morality is. And so that competing theory is a different thing, and it's also wrong. So I'm saying my competing theory of morality is the correct thing, even though he's talking about a different concept of morality. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. Because if if I've got a different thing in mind, you know, if I say, look, Tom uses the word morality, but what he really means is desire satisfaction. So when he says that the, so like, here's me translating, right? So if I could have that attitude, right? And I could say, I mean by morality, some folk theory of morality, right? And what Tom means is he's using a, a sort of Uh, what's the word, a homonym, right? It sounds the same as the word I'm using, morality, just like in the bank case, right? But actually, he just means desire satisfaction. So when he says, the rock hitting me on the head is immoral, he just means the rock hitting me on the head goes against my desires, right? So I understand when he says that that's immoral, that that's true from what he's saying. But it's just not what I'm talking about when I say that it, you know, when I say that something's immoral, I just mean something different to him. We just use the same words. But there's no conflict there, because I, you know, we're not even trying to describe the same thing. We're just using a word that has the same sound. Right? But if we're trying to describe the same thing, then one of us is right and the other one's wrong, right? So, I mean, if you're saying, I think you're saying that we're both trying to describe the same phenomenon, right? And it's not just that we have a similar sounding word for two completely different concepts. I think that's what you mean. I think you mean that everyone else is wrong when they talk about uh, rocks not hitting you being just unlucky. I think you think that they're just factually wrong about that, and that it actually is immoral. It's not just unlucky, and everybody right. else is wrong. Right? Right. Is that and right? So, yeah. So, but when people are talking about morality, they're presenting alternative definitions of morality, different ideas of what morality is. So we are talking about two different things, but it's the same general concept. We're trying to explain morality. So I think my definition of morality is right, and their definition of morality is wrong. But they aren't referring to the same kind of thing I am. They still think it's a different, like maybe subjective or non-cognitivism or any kind of... Well, well, no, no, wait, hold on. If I'm referring to something different to you, why is it wrong? Right? Why is what I said wrong? I mean, why can't it just be, you know, in if I'm referring to something different than you in the bank case, right, it's not wrong that I'm at the bank. Right? I am at the bank. I'm at the river bank. Right? So it's incorrect to say that what I've said is wrong because if, if, um, if we both are referring to our own concepts, then there isn't a disagreement there. If you want there to be a disagreement, it has to be that we're both trying to talk about the same thing. So I'm not sure you're tracking the same distinction here as me, but I'm not quite sure how you can have it both ways, right? To forget morality for a minute, just think, talk about the riverbank and the money place. How can it be both that we're talking, we have homonyms and we mean something different and that one of us is just wrong and the other one's right? How could it be both of those? Well, right. In that case, it can't be both. But like in the case of we just describing uh, morality, if you describe it as being like the property of a god or something, and I describe it as being a law of nature, I mean, we're talking about two different things. One is a property of God, one is the law of nature, but they're both referring to morality. So the idea of what morality is in those situations is different. We're talking about two different ideas of what morality is, even though they're both referring to morality. 
So in the case, so we're referring to different things, and I think the way I'm referring to it is right, and the way they're referring to it is wrong. So, but in the case of, in the case of the person who says, look, if someone says, what's moral is what God says, right? Divine command theorist or whatever. And then you're this guy who says, what's moral is what satisfies my desires or whatever it is, right? You can still have the same conversation that we just, that I've just been pushing you towards, right? Because you say, well, what's going on in that situation? Is it that the divine command theorist means the same thing? right, as what Tom means, right, or is it that they're just using the same word, the same sounding word, but there's no real disagreement there, right, is is it in fact, could it be, like in the bank case, that when the divine command theorist says, you know, smiting the Canaanites is wrong, or whatever, right, I guess, whatever, you know, make some biblical um, statement about what God commands, and he says that's right, and then you say, no, that's wrong because it's not desire satisfaction. That what's going on there is just the same as you know me, you saying X isn't desire satisfaction, and him saying X is God's command, right? And if that if that's what it boils down to, then it's not disagreement, right? Because actually, you know, we could both agree, right, that it, it isn't desire satisfaction, but it is God's command, and that you know that's not a disagreement. It has to be that you know that's the case of you know I mean Riverbank and you mean Money Place, so it's not really a disagreement. Um, it's only a disagreement if you're saying no, no, no. We're trying to talk about the same thing, and you're just wrong that me, that morality is divine commands, right? Because I'm right that it's not that, and it's desire satisfaction. And so it doesn't. I don't think you're like gra grasping the distinction I'm making. You, you can you can still have exactly the disagreement that I made it, with a divine command theorist versus you. Say, I'm just wondering whether you think um, to use the kind of technical term is it descript are you proposing a revision to the standard concept of morality are you trying to say we need to change the uh, you know morality should you we should all adopt my usage change the existing way of using the term yes or are you just right. describing um a different concept that's not yes. morality Yes, I'm th I'm proposing an objective morality that I think we should all change to. My definition is better or more right than everyone else's. Okay, so then, but then I'm wondering what. So, what does um, a theory of morality have to do to be uh, a good one? Right, that's the question now I need to ask because um, I'm wondering. Just, so, to to answer the question of should I change my understanding of morality to Tom's? I'd need to see whether it's doing what I want a theory of morality to do, right? Um, so what does a theory of morality have to do? I think, you know, generally speaking, it's supposed to be able to um, describe things that we care about in a certain way, right? Um, certain class of things we care about here um, are like injustices, um, uh, altruistic actions, right? Charities, all these types of, of certain types of actions we're interested in ascribing values to them, certain type of values, right? And I want a theory of morality to get that right. Now, I'm not going to be persuaded to adopt your theory if its output is that saving people from trains is is not morally good. I mean, it's just not doing what I want a theory of morality to do. So if you're telling me I should change, if you're a revisionist and you're telling me I should change my my view and adopt yours, um, you know why should I? It's just it seems like a kooky theory that's giving me like kind of bizarre output of what's good and what's bad. Right? It kind of feels like nothing is actually good on your theory when it seems like I mean I do think things are good, um, but so it's kind of weird, right? I don't. I just I'm not sure why I should. You're you're trying to sell me a product. It just doesn't seem like a very good one. If you want me to change my uh, my view, if you want me to revise my concept of the good to be in line with desire satisfaction. Um, yeah, no thanks, right? It just doesn't seem like a, an attractive proposition at that point. I guess that's where that's where I'd go if that's All right. the case you were making. All right, so in the case that the model you're using where it's moral to push the kid out of the way, it's only moral given the one pragmatic situation it works. If we try to apply that same standard to the, to the Magneto example or whatever in a different world that doesn't have the same limitations, then it's no longer moral to do that. So the only thing that makes that moral, the, the 
the what the truth maker of why that's moral is the pragmatic limitations. It's not that that action is actually moral. It's just less immoral than the alternative. And we can demonstrate this by looking at it from the perspective of a different world with different laws, like if we always Magneto or whatever. We can see there's a better, more moral option. Now, my model of morality can describe that in one situation. It just says it's immoral to push the kid out of the way, but it's a small immoral action. But it's and it's a moral good because you're preventing the greater immoral action. So it's two things there. I atomize it into the small immoral action of pushing the kid, but the morality of saving his life. And so it's the less immoral thing, and we should do it in that context. But my moral system can also describe what it would be like in the best of all possible worlds, in all possible worlds. Because if I have magneto powers, then it's not moral to push the kid out of the way, and I should lift the train and move it without imposing on his will, and that's a better option. So the reason my moral system is better is because I can apply it to all possible worlds and tell you what the moral and immoral thing is, and it's not subjectively contingent on just the pragmatic limitations of this one example. Right. I'm, I'm wondering which theory you think um, is limited to only evaluating actions in the actual world. Um, I, I'm sure there's probably some of them. I don't know, utilitarianism? What, go, explain that to me then. How is utilitarianism not able to evaluate um, situations that are not actual? Um, I'm not sure. I just threw that out there as an idea. I'm not sure what you mean. Okay, so it seems to me you're trying to sell me your theory, and what you're doing is you're saying the virtue of this theory is it's got this feature, which is that... Um, you can evaluate situations like if I was Magneto, right? And that's it's not actual, but I mean, it's possible in some sense. And the value of this theory, the good thing about it is that um, it's able, it's it's a sort of algorithm that I can apply to that situation. And it tells me uh, what would be good if I was Magneto, right? And I'm just wondering why you can't use utilitarianism. Um, why can't we watch an X-Man film and apply utilitarianism to it to figure out whether what Magneto does in the film is good? You know, is that do you think we can't do that? Oh, I'm sure we could, but I know there's certain kinds of perspectives on morality, like putting people in prison is good. It's justified. We should put people in prison. It's a good thing to put people in prison. I don't know exactly what moral system that would fall under, but I'd say that is wrong. We should not do that. Or it's it's we should see it as an immoral action. We are immorally putting people in prison but it's justified given the pragmatic limitations. And as soon as we get rid of the pragmatic limitations, we shouldn't do that anymore. And so I'm contrasting my moral system, which recognizes that what we're doing isn't good. It's just the least bad thing. And we should aspire to no longer do the least bad thing and do something that isn't bad at all. And so the when looking at the pushing the kid in the train example, it's not a good thing that we're pushing the kid. It's just the least bad thing. And if we had a better capability or more technological abilities, we shouldn't push the kid. We should do the thing that is imposes the least imposition of will in all situations. So my model gets to the same answer as essentially utilitarianism. It just describes it with different terms. So what's the what's the benefit of that? Well, why should I pick your theory over utilitarianism? Well, what I mean, I'm, so you're asking me to take a, a view. You're, you're proposing it as a theory, a realist theory, which I'm fine with. But then you're saying. Um, that it's I'm not just carving out my own concept, sort of idiomatic understanding of what morality is. Um, like it's not just I have my own usage for the term, and maybe it overlaps with yours, but we're talking about different things or something. You're saying no, no, we're really talking. We're talking about the same subject, right? When I talk about desire satisfaction, and you talk about divine command theory or whatever, it's just that I'm right and you're wrong, and you should change your mind and be persuaded. Uh, to follow me because I'm right about it. And I'm I'm asking why I should follow you down that line. Why should I think that you're right? I mean, you've come up with a theory, but why should I think that it's right? You know, what, what's it got going for it? And you seem to be saying that it allows you to do calculations on non-actual situations. And that doesn't seem like a feature that any moral theory doesn't have. I mean, I can use, I mean, I, I'm struggling to even imagine what a theory would be like that couldn't evaluate non-actual situations. You know, characters in a book or whatever, the story of like, I don't know, Jane Eyre or something. You can, you can, who is unable to evaluate that? What theory? There aren't any theories like that. Let's just be realistic. There aren't any theories that are only restricted to evaluating actual scenarios. I think, I think in even it would be possibly 
something that would be impossible from a moral theory that only applied to the actual world. I'm not sure about that. I would have to think it through properly, but it seems to me that there aren't any plausible contenders. So you're distinguishing your product in this marketplace of potential moral theories from exactly nobody. Everybody's able to do that. So it's not a selling point. So my argument here isn't that you can just apply it to other things, therefore it's right. My argument here is that the answer that pushing the kid is moral is the wrong answer. It is not moral. It is not good to do that. So, so any moral system that comes to that conclusion is wrong. It's well, okay, so everybody disagrees with you about that because that's a paradigmatically good. I mean, not everybody, of course. There are, some, there are obviously people who disagree, but it's not a peripheral case, right? You might be persuaded already uh, by some um, error theory or something that you know, nothing is good or something like that. But you don't think nothing is good. You think things are good. Some things are good. You just don't think that um, an altruistic act like that is good. So, and given well, that's a, good. that counts it's against your theory already, no, right? Because well, in the- let me let me try to articulate why this is the case. Again, uh, when we say that some immoral action, like pushing the kid, is good, then if we look at it in the context of a different situation, like having Magneto, pushing the kid would not be good in that situation. The only thing that makes it good is the pragmatic limitations. So, if we remove the pragmatic limitations, then it's not good. It is you can clearly see it's not a moral action to push the kid. So, okay, and do you think that's something that's a virtue of your theory, that if you evaluate it from the point of view of radically different agents, that you see that, it's, that it varies? I mean, I, okay, so look, I think um, if you're a utilitarian, I don't know if that's the alternative that we're thinking about, um, that, uh, so it's a trolley problem, I guess, right? So a utilitarian is going to say um, that you switch from the car going towards five people towards going towards one because you know killing one person is better than killing five because if you're the type of utilitarian that thinks you're maximizing pleasure or something like that is what you should do then that's what you should do right okay fine um but so i don't see why a utilitarian can't agree with you that if you had the power to i don't know bend space and time or whatever and stop the train from moving at all that that wouldn't be you know make up a third option where nobody dies that they would say yeah my theory agrees that that's the right thing to do there so you know remove as you say remove the pragmatic limitations and we can come to a different answer so again your theory isn't distinguished from utilitarianism it's not a benefit for your theory that you have the insight that if you remove the pragmatic limitations and all other alternatives are present that one of them might not be better i mean I, that's not a benefit to your theory either. So again, the argument is that certain models, certain moral theories make it seem like some immoral action is actually the best thing to do, that there isn't a better thing to do. So like in the case of putting people in prison or punishing people or judgment, certain models make those things seem like they are good things. Like the Christian model says judgment is good. We want this judgment thing. And I'm saying, no, my model is better than those models because it says judgment isn't good. It's just the least bad thing. And so the reason we should adopt my model is because it makes it, it's better than the models that say that there's this immorality like pushing the kid. And that's actually good. We should, we actually want to do this. And it, in certain cases like Christianity, where they think that judgment is something that is to aspire to, and it's not just the least immoral thing, those kinds of systems are objectively wrong. I'm not exactly sure about utilitarianism, how that would apply. I'm I'm a bit lost now. So sorry, you're saying that there are moral theories that say that judgment is good. Can you just expand on what you mean by that? Like uh, judging someone for uh, doing a crime or a sin or something, and they deserve to go to hell or whatever, and so we're punishing them, and the punishment is actually a good thing. It's a good thing to harm them in in response to something they did. They see that as a moral action. It's moral to judge or to harm or punish for crimes or whatever. And oh, from I see. My, so like justice. You're talking about the concept of justice. Right, right. And so from my perspective, that is a immoral. It's immoral to do that. It's uh, justified because you're doing one immoral action to prevent a greater immoral action, like putting someone in prison. But it's never the good thing to do. It's always the bad thing to do. It's just less bad than the alternative. And so, well, But on your theory, everything is always the bad thing to do, isn't it? No, there's always good things too. If you push the kid off the track, that is a bad thing. You've pushed him off the track, but it's also a moral thing. You also helped his will by making sure he wasn't going to get run over by the train. So it's a bad thing in the sense you pushed him and a good thing in the fact that you saved him. So it's not just one or the other. Sorry, why is it a good thing? 
because you protected his will. You served his will to help him live and not die, assuming he didn't want to die. So, so let's just go back to this then. So you're, it seems to me it's a bad thing on the view that what's bad is going against somebody's will um, because he's completely unaware of the train coming towards him. So he's not actively willing to get out of the way of the train. He's not like tied up and watching the train coming towards him. Right, that person might be willing, you know, to that someone would come and save him or whatever. And then you're going along with his will there. That's what he wants to happen, and you make it happen, and so that's good. Um, I can understand if that if that's the situation, but in this case, the person's just unaware of the train coming, so he doesn't have a will. He's it's he's, he's absent. So it, it seems to me you should call that amoral, right? Uh, Bad in the sense that you're thwarting the plan of building the Lego set, but it's also not good because um, he, it's not. Um, it's not, he's not willing for that thing to happen. Well, right? well, no. like rock missing me, right? It's amoral. Well, no, in this case, he has a will to live. We're assuming this kid wants, or you want to live in this case. And so if you want to live and I stop something from hurting you that's going to kill you, that's moral whether you realize it or not because you wanted to live. I helped your will to continue to live. But so, I mean... There's a difference. So, okay, let's just try and be clear about this then. So there's a difference between um, having a desire for something, right, and sort of implicitly desiring to have something. So let's call it explicit and implicit desire, right? So let's make the distinction. So I could explicitly desire, say, I don't know, a pizza when I, the advert comes on. And then I suddenly think, mm, yeah, pizza, like a really cheesy pizza or something. That's what I want to eat right now sounds good right now at that point i've got an explicit desire for pizza um but also i'm just kind of like i like pizza generally so if someone says um do you want to go for a pizza i'm like quite likely to say yeah because i like pizza right so i have an implicit desire i'm not actively desiring for the pizza all the time i'm not obsessively thinking about pizza all the time i'm only doing that when i'm like seeing you know walk past the restaurant and smell the the smell or whatever then i'm desiring a pizza so it's a difference between those two things so on your theory, are you saying that, I mean, the kid, I guess, implicitly wants to live, right, when he's playing Lego, but he's not thinking about how much he wants to live at that point, right? I mean, maybe the guy who's tied down watching the train coming along, maybe he's explicitly desiring to live because he thinks he's in danger. But the kid who's sitting there doesn't think he's in danger. Oh, sorry, me, it was me in the example, wasn't it? I'm sitting there with, I don't know, headphones on or whatever, and I don't realise I'm in danger. So I'm not explicitly desiring for the train, uh, for, for, for life. I'm only at best implicitly desiring for it. So your theory is it that um, what's good is what satisfies your implicit as well as explicit desires. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yes. Yes, correct. Okay. So now, so now I wonder about this type of case then. Um, what if I want something which is, so let's take an example of, um, um, a drug addict, right? That's a heroin addict that goes to his GP friend, his his doctor friend, and uh, says to him, uh, "Just write me a script for some pills, man. Like to get me some some heroin or whatever." Um, now, the doctor there is faced with someone who obviously has an explicit desire for the heroin, and he probably has an implicit one too, because when he's an addict, he's going to have that desire anyway. Um, it seems to me that you're going to say it's morally good for the doctor to write him a script for some heroin in that case. And I think you're going to find it very hard to wriggle out of that and say that it's not morally good. Well, no, I do. I think it's morally good to give him the heroin, but again, it's pragmatically uh, n not like a justified immoral action not to do so because of the consequences. Sorry, what's consequences got to do with it? Uh, he's going to die. It's the same kind of a thing. You could do the, Im the moral he's act. He's not necessarily going to die. We did, they're not poisonous pills, right? Uh, die eventually. Um, no, I'm not suggesting that he's, you're giving him something that will kill him. You're just giving him right. some, some heroin. It'll kill him eventually if he keeps taking it. It's bad for his I health. I mean, that's, that's... Hold on a second. It's not going to... These pills aren't necessarily going to kill him. There's no reason to think that. I mean, everything's going to kill you eventually. 
okay, so if they're not going to kill him, then why wouldn't he give him the drugs? Like, if it's just to make him feel better, sure, why not give him the drugs? Um, I mean, I think the answer is is something to do with, like, uh, it being bad to encourage addiction or whatever, that it's bad for that reason. It's a morally bad thing to do. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I guess I, to some extent I don't want to fill the gap in there too much because I'm not going to advocate a particular theory here. It doesn't really matter what I think why that reason is i just think that it's true isn't it that um encouraging a heroin addiction by like illegally writing someone a prescription isn't morally good um but it is clearly satisfying that guy's desires so i mean if you say well but in the long run he'll have some other desire that it goes against um i think we're we're just not talking about the same right i just agree i think you're I just say it's moral to give him the drugs. If he wants the drugs, it's moral to give him the drugs. Right. Okay. So then, I mean, I think that, um, so, so saying to everybody, so everybody's wrong that surprise parties are immoral and everybody's wrong that giving drugs to heroin addicts is actually moral instead of immoral. Right. I mean, I'm just saying like as a theory to sell to people, to try and tell people that, they should adopt your view. It has weird consequences. I mean, like, I don't, that to me, you're just not talking about morality anymore because it's just obvious. And well, the, the, the birthday case the isn't, are obvious. Is, the birthday case wouldn't be immoral. It's not immoral to throw someone a surprise party under my model. It, but you're right, the giving someone heroin if they want heroin, I see that as a, as a moral thing to do. If you're helping them to achieve their will so that they can experience what they want to experience, yeah, that's a moral thing. I totally grant that. So, well, hold on a second. So what about the birthday, surprise birthday situation? Well, how is that um, not immoral? Well, you're not imposing on their will implicitly or explicitly. You're not stopping them from living. Like if you're, it's not like a death birthday party where you're going to kill them or anything. So there's no way you're imposing upon their will or their desires implicitly or explicitly. I mean, it might be annoying if, I, so let's say, imagine I don't like surprise birthday parties. In actual fact, I don't think I would like a surprise birthday party. I um, don't really like that type of surprise or whatever, social activity generally or whatever. But like, um, I wouldn't consider it immoral if my friends threw a surprise birthday party for me. Um, but it obviously is immoral if I've got both an explicit and implicit desire not to have a birthday party thrown for me. Like I am, I'm kind of grumpy, don't really want to have um a surprise birthday party I mean, you just imagine that like i was listening to a podcast where they were talking about surprise birthday parties just before you pick me up and it's going around in my head and i'm thinking yeah i'd really hate it if that happened and then you open the door and everyone jumps out and says surprise you know at that, that point i have an explicit desire not to have a surprise birthday party thrown for me but that's not an immoral thing to happen it's just like annoying for me it's just like it's going against my desires but that doesn't mean that it's immoral it's just obviously at best amoral. And in fact, it's, I mean, I'm not sure anyone would think, I mean, it's, it just seems um, it's nothing to do with what people care about when they say that things are moral or immoral. The normal concept, the everyday concept, if you can end up classifying that as immoral, which you do, because that is a consequence. No, of the no, 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 that is just, not immoral. No, I do not under any circumstance classify that as immoral. You're not imposing on your will. You're not restricting their will. You're not preventing them from doing anything. You're not in any way restricting their will at all. It's just something they don't particularly enjoy. But like, if no, hold on, hold on a second. You could easily cook up an example where that's interrupting. Of course, it's interrupting my plans because I have no idea it's coming. Unless I've got literally no, I've never thought about what I'm going to spend the next half an hour doing. It is interrupting my plans. It is an imposition on me. Um, and I, I, all we have to suppose is that I don't like surprise parties and I'm currently thinking about not wanting to have one. And then it's an imposition on both my explicit and implicit desires. Right. And, and that could easily happen. So in that situation, surprise birthday party view is immoral. No, it still wouldn't be immoral. It would only be immoral if they tied you down and forced you to a chair and forced you to actually live through the the birthday party. Like if you still have your total freedom. But you come up with a definition. We agreed just a second ago that um, what you meant, you don't just mean implicit desires, but you also mean explicit desires, right? Anything that that, um, imposes upon them, anything that thwarts my desires is immoral, right? And this obviously does that. So, but now you're saying we well, you have to be tied down for it to happen, but that's not, I mean, 
you're changing, you're moving the goalposts here. Because... You, know, it's, it's, you you put in desires. I never said anything about desires. So it's not about desire. It's about like freedom. If you have the freedom to leave, it's not an imposition on your will. You have, because it's not, you're not being forced to be there against your will. Okay, so any imposition on your freedom is immoral. So that, that's what you're saying. Uh, essentially, yeah. It's the freedom of choice, essentially. Okay, so <laughs> well, that, that now seems like it's a different thing, idea altogether. So, I mean, that now, just having, so having a fewer options is immoral. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, because you could choose, like, if I, if I prefer having fewer options and I can set it so I only have the few options, that wouldn't be moral because you chose it. Sorry, I'm, I'm losing track of what's going on. And let's just be clear about this. Actions are the things that we're calling moral and immoral, right? So something happening is a, a, an a immoral thing or an immoral thing, right? Because, I mean, I, there are other ways we could look at it. You have moral character traits and or whatever, but we're not thinking about that. I mean, we can change to talk about that if you like, but we're thinking about actions. So now an action happening, someone punching someone in the face, say, might be immoral or it might be moral, right? But um, how is that, is it, how does the presence of alternative possibilities, um, does, is punching someone in the face worse if there are fewer options? No, I'm that, just not understanding how, how all freedom uh, can, can be relevant to determining whether an action is, is to be deemed moral or immoral. I'm just not seeing how these pieces fit together. Right, so it's if you want to be punched in the face, it's moral to punch you in the face. If you don't want okay, to, be punched, but that's desires again. So we are talking about desires. It's, it's the will, the will. It's not the desires can be a part of will. It may not be necessarily the only thing. So if I restrict your freedoms and I tie you up so you can't choose, regardless of what your will is, unless that is your will, that would be immoral. So I'm I'm restricted your will so that you can't choose. That would be immoral unless you wanted it. So, so if I doing like, an action you, they, which limits my choices is immoral. Yes, unless you specifically asked for that. So, I mean, I mean, on the one sense, right, like, um, I, I, I turn 40, say, right, my 40th birthday, I wake up and I find that I'm now no longer 39 anymore. Um, in some sense, my freedom has been limited by that, right? I'm not free to be um, 30 anymore. I'm not free to be in my 30s anymore. I, I now have to be in my 40s. Is that immoral, what just happened? Me, me, me becoming 40, is that immoral? Uh, well, I would consider like the physical consequences uh, immoral, but not necessarily the abstract idea. I mean, I guess I'm saying, do you think time passing itself is immoral? Is that because it does limit my choices, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I'd say it'd be morally superior if we could turn back the clock voluntarily if you wanted to. That would be a morally superior option, so yes. Okay, so just the passage of time is immoral on your theory? Yes, if it's involuntary, it's exactly like the rock falling on you without your consent. It's so immoral. Right, so... I mean, I'm, so things... So we... I'm just trying, trying to work out what the definition is that we're playing around with. So it feels to me like two different things are going on. One is um, that pushing the kid out of the way of the train. Um, first of all, he's not, um, it's not um, that he's willing to stay in front of the train. He doesn't know that the train's coming. So you push him out the way and it seems like it's an imposition on him because he's doing something, he is willing something in particular. Um, and you've limited his um, his freedom in the way that you've interrupted his activity of building the castle, right? But that's trumped by this implicit desire, you say, that he has to want to stay alive. Um, and that's the reason why um, interrupting his project um, is okay because you're saving his life. Um, but now it's it's not about desire satisfaction, you say. No, not that implicit, explicit desire satisfaction idea is not what you're thinking about at all. Actually, it's to do with limiting freedoms, right? Well, I consider those essentially the same thing or two branches of the same thing. So 
it's like if someone explicitly desired to be hit by a train, then it would be wrong to to force them out of the way, even though you'd be giving them more freedoms, sort of. So, so it, it's it's just, the way I phrase it is should be correct in impositions of will. So, if you desire something and someone helps you to get it, it's moral. And if they stop you from getting it, it's immoral. But yeah, so I'm I'm thinking, you know, like let's say I put a gun in your hand, right? And now I've given you the ability to shoot everyone in the room, right? So I've increased your possibilities of action. Right? So you're more free in some sense than you were beforehand. Um, but we're not going to say, I mean, presumably, it's, if you then go and do that, that there's anything. I mean, is it moral? Should we give everyone a gun? Everybody, because it increases their um, possibilities. Right? Get everyone a flamethrower. So they've got the possibility of setting everyone else on fire. Is no, obviously, but you're going to say something like, well, shooting someone, the reason that, you know, it's not good to increase your potential to shoot people with machine guns um, is because it limits other people's, you know, freedoms because they'll get shot, right? So it's a trade off between um, balancing your freedom to shoot people against their lack of freedoms by being shot. Is that the idea? Yes. So, but we can then, and we can know this because we can look at it in the context of the best of all possible worlds where it's impossible to impose on anybody voluntarily. In that world, it would be completely moral to give him the gun because he can't hurt anybody. So it would be moral to give him the gun in that situation. So, but the only reason it's in, not moral. In, sorry, in what situation? In the best of all possible worlds? Right. In the best of all possible worlds, it would be moral to give him the gun because he couldn't hurt anybody anyway. So well, if he wants a gun, give him a gun. Why can't he hurt anybody? In the best of all possible worlds is a world where any uh, involuntary imposition of will is impossible. So every interaction is voluntary. What happens if I try and shoot you in the best of all possible worlds? Uh, the bullet goes through me like it does nothing, like I'm a ghost, kind of, unless I actually accept the consequences or voluntarily choose to be hit by it. Right. So that's a limit on my freedom in that world then, right? Well, no, it's... Because no, I, can't, I can't shoot you properly. No, this, it only applies to yourself. It's your freedoms, not mine. You don't have any rights over my freedoms. So it only applies to you, yourself, your will, your world, not me. Yeah, m m so I want to shoot you, right? Um, and I don't want the bullet to pass through you. I want to actually kill you, say. Um, but I can't do that, can I, in the best of all possible worlds? Right, that's pu purely a semantics game. From my definition, you have no rights over me. It's, it's not a measure of restriction of your will. It's my will, and so you don't have any rights over it in the first place. So well, there's, we're not talking it's about not rights, though. We're talking about possibilities. Right? It's just not possible for me to shoot you in that world, is it? Right. So again, definitionally, I'm saying you only have... Uh, it's only an imposition of your will if it's your will. You don't have an... Imp it's not an imposition that you can't do something to my will. Definitionally, that's just the case. I'm just saying, in that world, I can't impose on your will, right? Correct. So that's less... But I can impose on your will in this world. So I have fewer options in that world than I do in this world in that way, right? No, again, so definitionally, this only applies, this, this principle of involuntary imposition of will only applies to your will. So it doesn't apply to other wills. So whether or not you can, what you can or can't do to other wills is just irrelevant to the model. You cannot, it doesn't affect it. It's not immoral that you can't impose on someone else. I, so I, we were moving away from the desire satisfaction model, and you said that what's wrong, really, is being tied down and made to endure a surprise party. Like that's what's wrong with it. It's not just that I'm not actively willing it, or even if I'm actively desiring against it, that my desire is thwarted. What would be wrong would be if I had to, if someone made me stay there and tied me down into a chair and made me sit through it, right? Because presumably you're thinking, well, you could just leave, right? So what's so bad about that? But if you couldn't just leave and you were stuck and you had to stay there, and then the thing about that that's bad is that my freedoms have been taken away from me and that's what you think is bad about that situation i mean have i mischaracterized the way that part of the dialectic went uh, no. at a birthday party and but you didn't like you even if you like pizza if someone forces you to eat pizza and you just like didn't want to be forced to eat pizza that would be immoral so even even if you have a desire for something and someone is forcing you to do it against your will that's immoral so it's not the desires necessary. Specific question though about would the part of the 
I was recapping to make sure that I was I understood you when you were saying that thing earlier and you just you've sort of changed subject to talk about something else. I was asking you at the point where we were talking about the surprise birthday party, you said it's not immoral, even in that situation where someone has an implicit and an explicit desire not to have a birthday party thrown for them, a surprise birthday party thrown for them. So it goes against their desires like that. It's only immoral if they tie them down and make them sit through it. I'm just wanting you to confirm that that was what you, you that's right. That's what you correct. mean. Yes, correct. Okay. And the reason that it's, the, the reason it's not just that you're, it's that your freedoms have been limited, right? Yes. So it's totally fine to throw you a birthday party where you can just leave. Like there's no, nothing immoral about that. Yes. And then, but then your characterization of the best of all possible worlds is one in which my freedoms are limited way more limited even if i try i can't do anything to you i can't impose my will upon anybody at any point i'm basically powerless in that world right the freedom the freedoms only apply to yourself it's if the freedoms of yourself are limited to yourself that's the immorality you don't have freedoms over anybody else that doesn't matter it's not the pure freedom essence of freedom to do anything isn't what the morality is it's freedom over yourself Right, but freedoms over only myself and not anybody else. I mean, over myself and other people because I can go and punch them in the face or whatever or shoot them or whatever, right? I am much more free in the actual world, it seems, than in your best of all possible worlds, even though the thing you think now that's kind of constitutive of being good is having freedoms. No, 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 it's not pure freedom. It's, you, it's not pure freedom to do anything. That's not the essence of good. It's pure freedom over yourself that's good. That's it. It doesn't apply to just essence of freedom where you can freely do absolutely anything to anyone ever you want. That's not the definition. The definition is freedom over yourself or freedom from being imposed on from anyone else also. So it's the freedom only applies to yourself, not, not other people. So it's not freedom to do anything. It's a freedom to not have done anything to me. Right. Yeah, essentially, it's for your military imposition. Sure. So if somebody locked me in a prison cell, come in and punch me in the face, I would be free from that happening, right? I, you, I, I don't have to worry about that happening, right? Correct. But you would have been locked so in a prison cell. Providing that's from, from, you know, if I'm outside on the outside world, um, I'm not free from you coming up to punch me because that could happen. So locking me up boosts my freedom from in that situation, doesn't it? Yes, but it also is you're also being locked up against your will. So that wouldn't that would be immoral. In yeah, that, that situation. would be freedom too, right? I, I lack freedom too. I can't, like, you know, go out and punch you in the face, right? Because I'm locked in a prison cell, but I have gained freedom from because you can't punch me in the face. I mean, you just said that it's freedom from that's important, not freedom to. No, it's both. It's both. So you, you, you okay. still need with yourself do stuff to us. In the best of all possible worlds that you described, one of them is civilian have freedom to punch you in the face. From, not both freedom from and freedom to. No, no, again, it's only freedom from and freedom only applies to your will to do whatever you want to anybody else. It's only you that has nothing right. to do with anybody okay. else. So here's my, in this situation, my, what I want to do, what my possibility that I want to realize is to punch you in the thing that I might want to do. And if you're just saying the only, the only types of will that are in, that doesn't count, right? You're just saying that doesn't count morally speaking. The only type of freedom too that counts are ones that don't involve other people right so i can you know i'm free to like i don't know pick up a beer and take a sip from it like that's a morally significant freedom but the freedom to punch you in the face that because it involves somebody else isn't a morally significant freedom i mean that's that's exactly the wrong way around right the the freedom to punch you in the face the one that involves two agents me and you that's the morally relevant freedom Right, the freedom to pick up a beer and have a sip in it, not morally relevant. Right, you've got it exactly backwards now. I mean, I, I appreciate I'm pushing you around here, but like, you're, I'm 
backing you into counterintuitive consequences. It, you, freedom too, but relative to only me and not others, guaranteeing that they're going to be morally irrelevant actions, like picking up a beer, right? That's not morally relevant. In order to make it morally relevant, it has to be that it can affect somebody, like saving them from a train or punching them in the face, right? The types of actions that I can do only matter morally if somebody else is involved. But you're saying that in the best of all possible worlds, the only actions that I'm free to do are ones that don't involve anybody else. But there's no point um, maximizing your freedom to do things that don't involve other agents is just morally irrelevant. It's just saying, I have the ability to do lots of things, none of which have any moral significance whatsoever. Okay, I get that, because it sort of gets you out of the problem that I'm drawing in front of you right now. But I'm just saying that the consequence of that is that you're identifying exactly the wrong type of freedom if what you want to talk about is morality. So when we're just circling back to the beginning, you were trying to sell me a product, right? A theory of morality that's revisionist in the sense that everybody else's idea of what's commonplace, right and wrong, they're factually incorrect and you're correct. And we should revise our beliefs to be in line with you. And I'm saying, okay, why should I do that? Sell it to me, right? What's the benefit of this theory? And when it comes down to it, you end up identifying like <laughs> exactly the wrong things to be morally relevant, it seems to me. Well, remember, when we were talking about the rock falling on someone and hurting them, that's immoral in my worldview. And time, if you don't consent to it, is immoral. So if you are being imposed upon by nature itself against your will, that's an imposition on your will and is immoral. It would be better if that didn't occur. So it's both. Both are relevant kinds of morality in my model. I think we should consider the world itself and rocks falling on people to be immoral because that's an imposition on their will. It doesn't matter if it's done by other people. So if you're if you don't have the freedom to lift up a beer can because nature is imposing on you like you're a paraplegic or something, that is itself immoral and we should try to fix that immorality. Are you still there? I can't hear you. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I forgot to push. Um, I'm not sure whether what you just said was supposed to be addressing what I said, or if you were just restating how you see things on your theory, which I guess is fair enough to do. But I suppose, look, I'm not persuaded that you're correct when you say um, what's good is what uh, sorry, what's bad is what imposes on will. I'm just not persuaded that that's true. And um, it's fair enough for you to say, um, you know, do a calculation, like, and say, well, look, on my theory, uh, if a rock hits you on the head, that's not morally good, right? That doesn't persuade me, does it, that I should buy the original claim. It's not evidence that the claim is true. It's just a consequence of what it would be the case if we bought the claim. And I suppose if you want to persuade me to change my belief, I'll want to see something like, I mean, so here's, here's a thought, right? Something like this. So you might say, um, so I'm not against revisionism in general, right? Um, and I think that um, my moral beliefs have changed over time and I've been persuaded to change my mind about things. But what didn't do that is someone saying, here's an algorithmic way of calculating good and bad in a situation, right? You should just change the way you evaluate things. You should stop doing that and you should start doing this, right? Adopt my algorithm, right? And then when I see, okay, well, let's have a look at it. What does it do? And I run it in a couple of situations and I'm scratching my head thinking, well, that's weird, right? It gives me this weird answer. I mean, I'm now just sitting thinking, I'm just not sure how anything would be better if if I'm not, you know, I don't see what the benefits are for me to change my view about this. It just doesn't seem um, that I should revise my concept, right? Um, but there are times where I've done that. And I think that, like, um, so one of them would be, like, reading certain bits of Peter Singer, right, to um, and understanding the idea of, like, um, 
uh, enlarging the um, kind of community of what counts as morally significant agents to include animals, right? I'm not sure I ever actively thought that they didn't count, but realizing that they, that the theory that I should have in my mind, whatever it is, um, should have that as part of it seems right. And I think I was, I don't know if I could describe that very well, but I feel like I was persuaded that that was the right way of looking at things. Um, now, in contrast to Singer's way of drawing that circle for me and saying it should be like this rather than how you've com- currently got it, like a sort of may- maybe latent sort of speciesism or something, the move from speciesism to um, the broader community of animals all having certain types of moral values, um, I'm persuaded that it's uh, that that theory gets at all of the things that I think moral theory um, is there to do. It characterizes the things that we care about when we're saying certain things are right and wrong in the right way. It characterizes all of those right categories, like killing things like cows or whatever and making them suffer is bad in the same sort of way as making people suffer. It just seems right that the thing I'm caring about when I'm saying that something is bad um, is is just that it's there in that situation as well as the one with the human. So characterizing, uh, moving that moral concept around, sometimes it fits better with the things that we care about. Not, not everybody agrees with that, right? There's an, there's an argument to be had. Um, but that was something that persuaded me. Now, in contrast, your view has very, very counterintuitive consequences. And I've tried to bring out some of them in this conversation. If, you know, I just don't understand what the benefit would be for me to revise my view. There don't seem to be any benefits. There seem to be con- negative consequences because I would end up having to say things like, I still think I would say on your theory that um, things like <clears throat> surprise birthday parties are immoral or amoral. They're basically immoral. Saving the kid who's playing Lego, I think is basically immoral on your theory. It's bad. Even you agree it's bad. Um, I think that um, the passage of time is bad on your theory. I think the best of all possible worlds that you describe isn't even, I think it's got the moral, the relevant moral concept exactly upside down. The best of all possible worlds is the one where I have the maximum ability to do things with no moral consequences. And that just seems completely the wrong way around. The morally best possible world would be the one that had the most um, risky <clears throat> uh, opportunities in which those choices were made the right way, it seems to me, right? Where, you know, you do have the ability to punch someone in the face. You really could, but you don't, right? It has to be a morally significant action. If I can't even do it, if I even wanted to, then it's not morally significant that I don't do it. It's just one that has the least suffering, right? It's just one that has the most desire satisfaction, but it has no moral significance. And it seems to me that you're just saying, well, I just mean desire satisfaction is the best. And then I just think, well, it's not revisionist, actually. You've just got a different concept in mind. You just don't think really significant actions, ones where I could influence someone, are even part of the paradigmatically best possible world. And that just seems wrong to me. I think you've just got a different concept in mind. And you think, I mean, frankly, you think saving an act of altruism. I can't think of a more uh, non-controversial example of something that could be classified as good. But to you, that is to some extent bad. And I think that at the end of the day, we're just talking about different things. You just are talking about desire satisfaction or freedom maximization or something, but you're not connecting it to any matters in terms of morality. So I don't know. I'm not sure we can really go much further with this because it just feels like your approach is you come up with an algorithm, you make the calculation, and then you camp out on that and just say, that's my, that's my definition. So that's what I'm saying. And I think that my view is that before we theorize about anything, before we come up with an algorithm or a calculation, we 
already experienced the world and our environment and our concepts are given to us um pre-theoretically right i didn't just find having to work out what the axiomatic basis for morality is i already have a bunch of concepts even if i don't have an axiomatic basis for morality and when you're trying to tell me that there has to be an axiomatic basis i'm going to match that against the things i already think um that's my approach to it so I feel like there's a bunch of pre-theoretic considerations that a theory is judged against, right? Like um, different for different types of theories. But if you're giving me a moral theory, I'm going to weigh it against those pre-theoretical considerations I've already got in my head, in my life, that, I've, that I already know. And I'm not going to... I'll change them sometimes, but I'll weigh it and I'll see what the outputs are. And I'll see if it makes sense, if it feels right to do that. And I'm I'm just uh, I'm not seeing in in your case any reason at all. I don't think you've even begun. I'm not sure you're even trying to um, fit the theory to these types of data, right? You're not building a theory of what the concept of morality actually is. Well, right? I, not, uh, you're just still... trying to come up with a theory and tell everyone else that they're wrong right. about it. So... So this whole theory is just based off answering uh, moral intuition, moral progress, and moral dilemmas. So this is a consequence of trying to answer all of those questions and plot it out on like a graph to see where it leads. And that's how I got this model. So it is based off of all of those things. Sorry, which things? Moral intuition, moral progress, and ethical dilemmas. Like if we just assess those as the evidence of morality and we try to look at what do they indicate how, how are all the different ways we can answer these questions and look at it kind of like a, a line graph we plot the answers on a graph what does it lead to my model is trying to answer that question if we answer all of these questions it kind of indicate something so what, what are the questions what do we have moral intuition is there moral progress and are there moral dilemmas? What, well, no, what are the questions? List of all of those things. So if you look at what is moral intuition, how has it changed over time? What is moral progress? And like plot out what it, what the moral progress has been essentially, or what we see moral progress has been. And we look at all the moral dilemmas and what is the essentially the intuition intuitionistic answer that we come to. And we look at how that could change over time. It seems to indicate something. And that thing that it seems to indicate to me is that the definition is just any involuntary imposition of will is how we define morality intuitionistically. And the, the part about how it affects like nature and if a rock falls on us, that's something we will see as immoral in the future once we get to the point of that level of moral progress, essentially. So it's not something I agree that it's totally counterintuitive right now, but I think we will see it as immoral in the future, just like at one point we didn't see killing animals as immoral, but once we got to the technological point where it was no longer necessary, society kind of aggregated to the belief that yes, killing animals is immoral. And so I think that's kind of the argument I'm making is that um, once we get to the point of moral progress, we will actually see nature as itself being immoral. But um, why should I think that it's progress to see rocks hitting me on the head as immoral. Uh, I'm not sure. But I mean, why? What? So how how is that the way the way that the line on the graph is going? Well, it seems to be that the line on the graph just is any involuntary imposition of will, and that is one. So rocks flying on people is an involuntary imposition of will, and so we will see it that way eventually. I'm not, well, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure why moral progress um, has anything to do with imposition of will. Look, moral progress generally is people saying things like, you know, slave, we don't do slavery anymore. And we like emancipation of like women and stuff like this. What's that got to do with? Um, I mean, obviously, I guess I can understand how in some sense um, you could see slavery as being involuntary imposition of will. I mean, obviously it is. Right. But part of the issue with that is recognizing all humans to be of the same moral value um that's i think as much traditionally that's how it's understood right that like you know didn't matter about the color of the skin or whatever it's just that we all equally valuable or something and that and when put it like that it's got nothing to do with involuntary imposition of will right you could still think that i mean so for instance i still think that like um uh so if when 
so here's an example from the blog post, right? I mean, like, a, if I go and buy, I go and I order a beer, right, in in the pub, right, and then um, I don't want to pay for it, right? I'd much rather not have to pay for it, right? Some some kind of imposition on my will to have to pay for it. Maybe I down it and then say to the barman, "I want that to be on the house, right? That's my will." And he says, "You know, no, you, know, you have to pay for it, right? Give me give me some money." He's imposing on my will there, right? But it's not immoral. It just you know sometimes stuff happens that I don't like. Right. But as an adult, that doesn't matter. You know, too bad. Right. Too bad for me. And I'm I'm like a baby. If I say that that's wrong, it's not wrong. It's just against what I want. Those two things are different. So, I mean, ultimately, desire satisfaction isn't the same thing as morality. It feels to me immature to think that those two things are the same. Um, so to use use your example of the slavery example, uh you can characterize it in that way, but characterizing it in that way isn't the same as all the other examples of moral progress like veganism. Like considering animals is equal to humans is not the same as considering humans the same as humans. There's different concepts. So if we try and create one principle that describes all moral progress, the principle we seem to get is any involuntary imposition is bad. If we can get rid of it, we should get rid of it. So no, well, no, I don't look. What's wrong with exploiting animals isn't necessarily that it's against their will, because um, their will is not necessarily like I mean, like the child who's playing in front of the train is is completely doesn't have any idea about what's going on around it in the same way, right? Chicken can't understand the idea of a factory farm, even if it's in one. It's not straightforwardly against its will, like the way that. Um, making a slave work in a field is right, but, right? But it has that implicit the thing, about, the thing isn't about imposition of will. I mean, it doesn't have to be anyway. It seems like you could read it that way. I mean, you you read it that way. But when I said before about like the other way to read what's going on with the emancipation of slaves is that the realization that skin color isn't a morally significant difference, right? The emancipation of women is the realization that gender isn't a morally significant difference. And the emancipation of animals is just to realize that species isn't a morally significant difference, right? And in, that's where the line is going on the graph. So nothing oh, right. to do with the imposition of will. So, so then we could say a realization that nature isn't a morally significant difference. So we could just apply the same thing and say, well, rocks falling on people is just as immoral and realizing that there's, there's no morally significant difference between mm -hmm. rocks falling on people and people hurting people. Sure, but but I mean, it's not just removing all notion of morally significant distinction, right? I mean, you could I mean, maybe you think that just um, all we're doing is realizing that moral concepts don't apply to anybody, right? Maybe that's where the line is going. Um, I don't think that's right. I think that what's going on is that what's the the slave, the woman, and the animal are all moral patients, right? Which is to say, something like they can suffer. Right. And the reason that um, and that in that respect, they're all exactly the same as us. Right. So that the treats treating them differently is to treat things that are all equally moral patients as if they were as if some of them were just inanimate objects. But to treat and, and then so not all of them are moral agents, of course. So we don't think that chickens are moral agents, even though they're moral patients, which is to say, it's wrong to mistreat a chicken, right? But a chicken can't morally mistreat you because it doesn't have the concepts itself. So if it pecks you on the foot, that's not morally bad. But if you kick it, it's what you've done to it is morally bad, right? So that we, I think that, that, that our understanding of morality is growing in that respect. So we can see the equal moral patientness of the three groups that we've got. But we also recognize a distinction between being an agent and being a patient. And we also see a distinction between being an agent and not being an agent, right? The chicken isn't an agent, but also a rock isn't an agent. So a rock hitting me on the head isn't going to be, you're, you've changed where the line's going. If you think that we would, I mean, we'd regard chickens as moral patients, uh, as moral agents and rocks, right? <laughs> Is not to see where the line's going, it seems to me. You're just drawing a different line. So you're saying moral progress is evidence of your theory, but I just think you're reading your theory into moral progress. 
Well, and no, of course, some people would say there is no moral progress. We can well, we can use examples like it's immoral to help someone die if they want to die. But even if that's even if, if something causes them suffering, if people want to suffer and you, they ask for you to cause them suffering, it's moral to help them suffer. So it's not about suffering in that sense. No, uh, it's not well, just about suffering. I agree. So, so the point is, is that they all, if you add that in, it's the desires is also a part of it. So if someone desires something that may not be good for their well-being or whatever, it's still moral to give it to them. So the, it's about helping someone to achieve their will or preventing someone from achieving their will. It's the involuntary imposition of will. It seems like all of the different evidence points towards that one principle. And I don't see any well, examples. Don't. I don't. I don't agree with that. I mean, I think that you can, it could be moral to help somebody end their, their own life. I think that could be moral. Um, it could also be immoral, right? It's not going to be algorithmically dictated by simply considering whether or not the consequence of the action causes suffering or not. It's too. It's more complicated than that. And it's also not going to simply be the application of the algorithm of whether or not it's an imposition on their will, right? Neither uh, of those two. Give me, an example. give me an example of how that would not accurately describe the situation. How it would not accurately describe a situation. You I'm said... Whether or not it's moral wouldn't just be de determined by whether or not it's an imposition on their will. Right. So you gave That's the example of saying. helping someone to kill themselves may be immoral. And I'm saying that sure, can't be. Yeah. The it could be immoral. I think I can imagine a situation where it would be immoral, but it wouldn't be an imposition on their will. Um, what do you mean? Well, I mean... Let's say that someone has some kind of learning disability or something, and you could get them to think that that's that what they want to do is um, kill themselves. And I think that you can easily imagine a situation where that isn't like euthanasia, where it's someone with a terminal disease who wants to end their life. Um, even though they have that desire, it's not good. It's not a good thing to do to uh, encourage that or to go make them go through with it. That'd be the wrong thing to do. Right, I agree, but let's stick with just rational minds here. If you have a rational mind, how could they, how could, if they want to die, how could it ever be immoral to help them to die? Well, what's, so I'm happy to talk about that in general, but in the context of the theory, the type of theory that you're advocating was a simple algorithmic theory that just gave a condition. And it said, as long as this condition's met, then that's good. And as long as this condition's not met, then that's bad or whatever, some other condition is met, then that's bad. Um, and uh, what's happening is I'm giving you a situation that meets that condition. And then you're saying, yeah, 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 but that doesn't count because they're not rational. Or yeah, yeah, that doesn't count but uh, because that's um, an action that doesn't just involve myself or whatever. And it's like each time that what's going on is I'm showing you that the application of the principle, as you stated it, has this consequence. And well, no, that's a problem. That's a to get out of it. You're changing what the condition is. Or it has no, to be something not, that's well, no, I'm not at all changing the condition. So again, uh, uh, the well, when did rationality come into it? You haven't mentioned that up till now. Because that's a limitation imposed on them by nature, just kind of like time or the rock falling on them. So the fact that they are intellectually incapable of making rational decisions is, in fact, a limitation, an immoral limitation by nature. So we'd have to get rid of that because it's just another pragmatic limitation. Well, let's say there are no limitations whatsoever, right? So then I can shoot you in the head, right? Again, the limitations only apply to the case of your free will. It doesn't apply to other people. So that so has there have to be, but but that's not the same as no limitations, then, is it? There are limitations. Right. I never said no limitations. That's not a part of the model. It's only no limitations in so regard to you yourself. Said that the reason that you can bring in rationality is because it's a limitation. And what we have to do is to get rid of all the limitations, right? So it's not about just being limited. But then actually, if we go down that path, like we just saw a minute ago, you don't think the end path, the end of that path is a situation where you can do anything. It's a no, situation where you just have freedom from. Clearly, clearly different. One is the limitation of the rationality of yourself to use your mind. And the other is the limitation to impose on someone else. It's a contradiction. So it's only the freedom of yourself. It doesn't apply to other people. So you, the free, you should have the freedom to be able to think rationally. And if you don't, because of some kind of biological limitation of nature, that's an immoral Im imposition on you by nature, which we should get rid of. We should not get rid of the freedom, the, the limitation that you can't hurt other people. That's, that's a completely different thing. 
Okay, so look, let's just take a few steps back so that this is clear. So we're talking about the action. So there's two agents, right? One of which is considering whether or not to do an action, right? And that action is to encourage the other one to kill themselves. Yeah. So it's whether or not that person's action is right or wrong. Now that person, let's just say is perfectly rational. Okay. Whatever that means. Um, the other person isn't. Okay. Now, are you saying that it makes a difference that, I mean, what are you saying? I, I suppose I, I'm just wondering whether I think that your theory says what, what the first person does is wrong if it's an involuntary imposition on the other one, right? But well, it no, isn't the, in this case because the, the they first, have been so the, tricked into thinking that that's, that's a no, good thing. So his actions are never immoral. Trying to convince someone to kill themselves isn't immoral because you're not imposing on their will one way or the other. The immorality is the fact that the, uh, this person B has some kind of biological limitation making them susceptible to being encouraged without the ability of rational thought. So that natural limitation because their brain is incapable of processing things rationally is the immoral limitation by nature, like a rock falling on you or like time going by without your consent that's the immoral part it's not the person trying to convince you to kill yourself that's not it that's amoral it doesn't impose anything either way so the immorality is the well, part by nature you have to get rid of the limitation by nature and then say if you're talking to a rational person and you're trying to convince them to kill themselves there's nothing immoral about that like they'll just say no or choose to if they want to but they, they still have the choice ultimately i mean I don't know. I, I think it is immoral in many cases to encourage people to kill themselves. I mean, I think there are weird like Instagram groups where people encourage each other to, you know, live unhealthy lifestyles, obsessing about death and not eating and whatever, all these types of things. And I think obviously that's immoral. And you're just saying, oh, well, they're free to not do it. So it's not immoral. I mean, you're just what you're doing is you're just running with the calculation whatever the consequences are and that's fine and maybe i'm wrong about morality maybe i'm just some fuddy-duddy old man who's got some lame you know conservative moral position or whatever right i'm not saying that i know that i'm right i'm just saying like um the there's no you're not it's not like you're not interested in trying to capture the folk theory of morality you're just interested in saying here's a theory and this is the consequence of that theory, and therefore, and you know, um, you should change. You should all change your mind and do what I and accept that I'm right about it. You know, but when it comes to morality, there's no litmus paper to test it against. There's no actual test that you can tell whether what you're saying about morality is right compared to mine. Right. The only thing we can do is like work out whether. It seems to me the only thing that we can really do is work out whether the consequences of a proposed definition, right? What the, the way to understand it is you're saying, I think this is what the, the, the concept is, right? Like, this is what everybody means when they're talking about morality. Maybe everybody, not everybody agrees, and there are some peripheral cases where people disagree, but the general concept of morality, that one that's in the popular culture, right? The one civilization is built on. That concept is this, but you're not saying that. You're saying it should be this other thing, right? It should be desire satisfaction or whatever. And I just don't know why I should accept that. It just has these weird consequences that, like, people would be, in, you know, there's nothing wrong with encouraging people to kill themselves. Um, rocks hitting you on the head is bad, but encouraging people to kill themselves isn't. I mean, okay, is that, do you want that to be the case? I just, I'm not sure why. So what project so, are you doing? I'm just I'm finding it more and more puzzling as we're talking. You're not right. trying to characterize morality. This isn't no, no, a theory of morality. I'm absolutely trying to cal to uh, characterize the classical view of morality and then projecting that into the future to see what the consequences will be. And they will be unintuitive consequences, but it still characterizes the current view of morality accurately, as far as I can tell. Like for example, the the one you listed about people promoting unhealthy lifestyles on Facebook or whatever, as long as they're not promoting it to children or people who don't have cognitive faculties to some level, there's, I see nothing immoral about that at all. Like if people enjoy or value those kinds of things, they should have every right to, to idolize those kinds of lifestyles. There's nothing immoral about that as long as they're rational minds, essentially. So why, why do you consider those immoral?
I mean, but when you say you think it's not immoral, you just mean you're just you're just in the mindset of like this is what my theory says, right? That so that's why. No, I mean, no, no, I think it's it's that is also one consequence of it. But intuitively, emotionally, uh, when I look at it, and we say, well, should people have the right to kind of idolize these kinds of lifestyles if they choose to? I mean, the moral answer is yes. I don't see. I think most people would probably agree with that. More like a libertarian kind of freedom. Like if you want to do those kinds of things, go for it. There's nothing immoral about that at all. I don't think that would uh, go against the the view of morality that most people have. If people want to do that kind of stuff and they have a rational mind or whatever, then they should have the then they have the right to do so. That's not immoral at all. I don't see how that would be immoral, even given the. Well, I mean, encourage. I mean, I I don't know about inst. I mean. Pff. I don't know how you can gauge this. We can't do a poll. There's there's no way of saying what most people would think, right? I don't know. Maybe you're right. I don't know. Maybe people don't care about that. But I think there are certain. I, there's a reason that euthanasia is not legal, right? That m- most people are very dubious about the moral virtues of that. Like, there is a there is a large amount of people who think that it should be legal, right? And I'm not even saying that I'm one of the people who thinks it should be illegal. I'm just saying it's not obvious that everybody thinks encouraging people to kill themselves is perfectly fine it's, it's not clear that that is a, an obvious clear majority view right it's definitely not clear that that's the case but it's obviously true on your theory that it's moral so that it should be right it just means everyone's wrong about that because they don't hold your view so you're not trying to elucidate the concept that's actually there you know muddled though it might be in society the one that we actually work with every day the one that people are judged by other people about the one that people design laws to try and promote, right? The one that, you know, blame is a, is attributed and praise is attributed towards. You're not trying to capture that concept. You're just trying to say um, what the consequences would be if we changed our way of talking to track desire satisfaction no, instead. No, no, no. I'm trying to do both. So I'm trying to use the current model of morality to accurately describe that and then project into the consequences, which will be counterintuitive. So like, for example, it, we, what? Is somebody talking? It can't be both. We went, we went through this right at the beginning. It can't be both that the person says riverbank and money place. Like, it can't be that they are talking about the same thing and that they... Um, use the word to point, pick out different concepts. It can't be both. I'm, I'm not sure what your objection here is. So I can describe what we see as morality today and s- try and describe that with one principle and then project the consequences of that principle. There's no contradiction there. I don't see what your objection is. But your, um, your algorithm obviously produces consequences that are uh, out of line with the folk concept of morality in the future and when it comes to those when it comes to that type of observation you just bite the bullet and say yeah but my view is that that isn't immoral every time right right so my view is is that in the future once we get to that level of moral progress we will have we will agree as a social as a society that that will be seen as immoral so we don't see it now but once we get to that level of moral progress we will that's kind of the prediction i'm making so i agree that we do not see that as moral right now and so it describes everything we see as moral and immoral right now and then makes predictions about what we will see in the future which are those consequences so it, it's still trying to describe the current level of morality and then project into the future what it will be in the future but it's what the what you're talking about the current level of morality now and what it will be like in the future are different things aren't they right but they're a consequence of the same principle so so they're they're not actually different things they just seem like different things because we're at different points in time so i can say one and the same action is going to be deemed right today but wrong tomorrow right like the or or morally ambiguous today like the rock falling off the hit thing and hitting me on the head but in the future we're going to think that that's morally wrong so they're different things aren't they Right. So my model can describe how we feel about them today and how we feel about them in the future. So it tries to describe both. It, no, it's got nothing to do with, like, it's not about how we, your theory doesn't describe how we feel about them today, right? Your theory says it's wrong if a rock hits you on the head. It doesn't say anything about it. It happens to be that most people disagree with you and don't think that that's the correct way of looking at it. Your theory doesn't describe that. 
it right. describes it just that, predict that, that's it, a future it, thing that is complete, completely about the future. It has nothing to do with how we feel today. So one of the examples of how we feel today is like pushing the kid off the tracks. I can say that is the right thing to do because it's the least immoral thing to do. So it describes yeah. it as being the correct choice. And so it describes how we feel about it today. We should push the kid off the tracks. So it describes the conditions we have today and then makes predictions about the future. And the rock thing is a prediction about the future. It has nothing to do with how we feel today. The, the the rock thing isn't a prediction about the future it's you, you the prediction is that you're saying i think people will agree that that's wrong right that's a prediction your theory doesn't say that that's going to happen it doesn't make that prediction it doesn't make any predictions it just it it's an algorithm that says of actions that they're right or wrong or neither right well, no, it doesn't that, make that predictions it's making the prediction that once we get to the technological level that we can view morality in this way just like we got to the technological level where we um no longer needed to eat meat we started to view killing animals as being wrong once we get to the technological level where people don't normally impose on other people ever and only nature imposes on people we'll start to see that as immoral that is a prediction that the model makes that's not something we feel now obviously but in the future once we get to that level we will feel that that will be the moral intuition of that time frame i I don't understand how it makes a prediction about what will happen in the future. So it looks at moral, I can't see it. It looks at moral progress and it says that every change in moral progress can be described when this one principle of involuntary imposition of will. Every single time we see something as moral progress, it's about removing involuntary imposition of will. And as we continue to remove involuntary imposition of will, usually with technology, we start to see other things as as involuntary impositions that we didn't see before. So we realize animals, involuntarily imposing on animals is wrong. We shouldn't do that. And then culturally, once we, re once we get to the point where it's no longer a necessity to kill animals, we start to recognize that's immoral. And we, we start to move in that direction. So as we gain technologically more involuntary impositions of will that we currently don't see as immoral, we will then see as immoral, just like in the case of the animals or um, uh, gay rights or different races or sexes, all of those things. They all seem to follow that same pattern, as far as I can tell. I don't think it makes that prediction for this, the, re the reason why, right? It, it might be that what happens as technology increases is that people um, increasingly stop caring about what's morally right and wrong and only care about whether or not will is imposed on or not. And if that change happens, then fair enough, right? And even if they say, um, that now we think we call impositions of will morally good and morally bad. I would just say that what happened is they've changed the meaning of morally good to to track desire satisfaction, right? That's it. That's they just stopped caring about morality and used the word to mean something else. Like when that guy uses the word bank to mean river bank, and the other guy uses bank to mean the money place, right? They, they weren't ever talking about the same thing. They were just talking about two different things. And you're just saying society uses the word bank to talk about money places. And I think that soon they'll use it to talk about river banks. That's it. That's not moral progress. That's just changing what you care about. And that might happen just like if society gets worse and there's an eco ecological disaster and we start, I don't know, living in like some Stone Age Mad Max situation and we're all really violent to each other and we stop caring about um, morality and animal rights or emancipation and stuff. And we start caring about like where the drinking water is or something. I mean, that might happen too. And we might just stop using the word morality, but, uh, so what, right? I mean, I just, that's not a prediction. It just, you're just saying society will change and they'll agree with me. <laughs> right, that's so not I'm, a prediction of your theory. I'm it's saying you're okay. making a prediction. Your theory yeah. just says, what's is moral it? is an imposition what's immoral is an imposition of will and that can't make a prediction so again what we call morality is essentially the evidence we have of morality is moral intuition moral progress and the moral dilemmas that is just whatever that is that's morality and so if as society changes those things change they're still describing the same thing which is morality morality is those things essentially or that's how we know of it wait sorry so, morality is moral intuition moral progress and moral dynamics well, that's uh, epistemically that's how we are aware of morality we, our evidence of morality is moral intuition moral progress and moral dilemmas 
So I don't. So moral progress isn't evidence of morality, right? You have to think that things are moral for them to con to be morally progress morally progressive, right? You have to think that um, emancipation is good for it to be an instance of moral progress. If you're an error theorist, you don't think there's any moral progress, right? Because you don't think there's any morality. Yeah, all moral statements are false. So obviously there can't be any improvement. There can't be any more you know, more true morally good statements around now than there used to be because it's always only false ones so it's not evidence of morality it's just if you think that the moral progress is a real thing then that's a consideration in favor of certain types of meta-ethical theories like realism over anti-realism right, right. it's so, not evidence of of morality though you need to pedantic. so when we talk about morality we're talking about those things our moral intuition what we see as moral progress and answers to moral dilemmas when we're talking about morality those are the things we're talking about like what causes those things how did they get here do they correspond to something when we're talking about morality it's those things that is morality the, the we know of to get to morality so if those things change, we're still talking about morality. It's not like we just changed definitions socially. Those are the essence of what we're talking about. So the, so it's not just we're changing definitions at some point from what we currently conceive of morality to involuntary impositions of will. It's that those things represent what morality is to us. How does moral intuition represent what morality is to us? I don't understand what you mean. It's like when we see a, an apple drop, that refers to what gravity is. We're, we're trying to describe the, the function of what causes that. So when we see moral, our own moral intuitions, when we talk about morality, we're trying to describe what causes those moral intuitions, what those moral intuitions are. So it, it's, the, it's the observed phenomenon of the thing we call morality. Uh, moral intuitions are a way of trying to explain how we can know that moral facts are true right it's an it's an, an epistemology of morality right so like how do you know that I don't know, killing is wrong i have an intuition that killing is wrong that's what that is it's an it's a pathway a conduit between my attitude about what's right and wrong and the fact itself intuition or something and the intuition itself even if it's about morality isn't constitutive of morality. I could also have intuitions of other things, right? Intuitions themselves aren't moral. Even if you know, I am having an intuition about whether a moral fact is true, it's not constitutive of morality, right? It's just, it feels like you've just got, moral no. intuition is just something people talk about in, in ethics. So is moral progress. And what was the last one? Dilemmas. This is just ways that we can play with moral concepts to see like how well our concepts like track with our, uh, how well our proposed you know, explanations and definitions track with our concepts, right? And again, dilemmas can be can be used in all sorts of different areas too, not just morality. So I, they are used in, in ethics, but they're not constitutive of morality. They're not even desiderata that you want to try and keep in place when designing a moral theory. The things that are, are the things I was talking about, where, you know, you want to say something like, you know, saving people from oncoming trains is moral that's a desiderata that you want to keep in mind when yeah, building a moral theory that's a moral dilemma so so these are these are phenomenon moral intuition is a phenomenon we experience we experience having intuition of morality and we're trying when we talk about morality we're trying to talk about well, what is it that those intuitions refer to maybe it's just something in our brains maybe it's some undiscovered thing of the universe or maybe it's a the properties of a god or something when we talk about morality we're trying to talk about what our intuitions and our the moral progress and the moral dilemmas are referring to what are they well, evidence of i think that you're you're messing together two different things here i think you're trying to say that we all have beliefs that that certain things are right and wrong right and that's true and we you know we want to try and preserve that right we do have beliefs so the error theorist says that there are no true moral statements and he has to reconcile that with the fact that people think that there are right people believe that you know the nazis were bad or whatever right cliche example so you have to reconcile that but intuition means something very specific right no intuition is a way of coming to have a belief right? it's a justification right in philosophy that's it's not just you you know it's not you can't just say you have to assume that we all have moral intuitions and right, every moral theory has to explain that no they don't right it's what you have to assume is that everyone has beliefs about morality 
right? That's something you have to do. Beliefs and intuitions are different things. And it's the same with moral progress. Not everybody believes that there is moral progress. Right? It's not something that everybody has to explain. It's just that if you think that there is moral progress, then that tells in favor of one theory or another. If you think that uh, you know about moral uh, facts, then you have to appeal to something like intuitionism to get there. Otherwise, you have to propose some other way of knowing about them. Otherwise, how do you know them? Right? What justifies those beliefs? So these are things that you have to use um, along the way of designing moral theories, but they're not evidence for moral theories. And no, they're no. not things that moral theories have to explain. I, I don't think you're, these are just phenomenon we experience that we use to try and explain morality. They're not necessarily required. Like if I see an optical illusion on a paper and I'm trying to explain what the optical illusion is, I mean, maybe the optical illusion is evidence that there is the paper is really moving, or maybe it's just an illusion in my mind. It's just a phenomenon I'm trying to explain. So moral intuition, moral progress, and moral dilemmas are just phenomenon we're trying to explain with morality. Right. But it's, so the thing you're trying to explain is moral beliefs, not moral intuitions. Right. Yeah, I just clap. And moral progress isn't something that you're trying to explain because, I mean, unless if you're in a, you know, if you're talking to someone who happens to believe in moral progress, then that fair enough, right? Like if you're, you know, you may as well just say um, the fact that pushing someone away from a train is something that we have to explain is morally good, right? But you, you might not think that it is, right? Like in this conversation, you didn't think that it was. So what if you meet someone who says, well, I just don't think, you know, I think society has gone downhill recently, right? There's no moral progress. It's worse than it used to be. I don't know, back in the 50s or whatever, when stuff was good. Nowadays, it's all debauched and corrupt, right? But that guy, you can't say a moral theory has to explain moral progress because he doesn't believe in it. So obviously, it's not something a moral theory has to explain, moral progress I never, I never said it was something that the moral theory had to explain it's just an example of something moral theories are used to explain so uh, i'm not sure i'm not sure what you're not understanding here i'm just saying here are examples of things that we use to try to outline morality it's like and by moral intuitions i mean the way w what we feel when we think about morality when we talk about moral beliefs it's an intuitive feeling in our brains that's it there isn't like a moral well, belief. I think you say lots of different things about this. And I think earlier you did say that these were evidence of morality. And maybe you misspoke about that and you don't mean that to be the case. But you seemed to me like you were saying that the job of a moral theory, in fact, I think you said that they were what we mean by morality at one point. And it seemed like what you meant by that was that they're, the job of morality is to explain these phenomena. And I'm just, every time I'm pointing out to you that the way that you're using the language is indicating to me. A specific thing when i clarify that with you you say no 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 that's not what i mean right it's not evidence of morality it's not actually that moral intuition it's not um that we have to explain these phenomena it's none of those things but you give the impression that that's what you mean because right, the way i think you're talking about it makes that sound like that i think you're misunderstanding what i mean by intuition so when i say moral intuition i mean the feelings that we have when we see like an action occurring when someone's killed or whatever we have a feeling and, and beliefs follow from those feelings, but the core of what morality is fundamentally is the feelings that we have when we see moral and immoral things happening. Those are the well, intuitions that we have. That's what we sense as morality. I think it's unhelpful, though, to have a conversation like this, a philosophical conversation, fairly technical one about things in metaethics, to have like your own idiomatic usage of a term like intuition there when you say moral intuitions, right? Because it, what you mean is just the fact that people feel that actions are bad when they happen, or people feel that they're good, right? And you just mean, that's what I'm saying is a moral intuition. Intuition is a specific thing in, in philosophy and in, in ethics. Intuitionism in particular, right? The massive meta-ethical theory about the way that um, beliefs about morality are justified. So it's quite unhelpful to then you know, use that term in an idiomatic manner that's that need, mi misleading me into thinking that you're saying something else. It just feels like you're, I think a lot of this, I mean, I, I honestly think that your use of the word morality is similarly idiomatic in the sense that it's what you mean by morality. But I think that you're not really interested in the fact that that's um, out of accord with what the concept means, you know, the general non-problematic case of that concept being applied um in the folk instance i mean that's fine because you know th there are other people who have that situation too i mean like error theorists for instance they'll say when i use the term morality 
um, it's false. Right? When anyone ever uses that term, whatever they're saying about, you know, whenever they say something is morally good, that's false, right? And that conflicts with the uh, folk theory too. So it's not like, you know, um, that's not... Uh, it's uh, just that I feel like you are you don't want to accept that that's the type of view that you have to say, no, I'm just... You're cutting it out. You're saying... I'm, you're saying that your theory isn't controversial, like the um, like the error theorist, right? You you want it to be both ways, basically. That you're tracing the everyday folk concept, but also it's radical and revisionary, and it has all sorts of counterintuitive consequences that we should all just accept. And you want to have it both ways at the same time, and that for me it just feels kind of incoherent. The project in general it just feels that like you haven't sorted out what. The, the moral theory is supposed to be doing and which type of direction you're trying to take it in like is it revisionist or is it descript descriptive you want it to be both that doesn't make any sense right it can't be both if you want to change this the, if you want to describe a different concept from the folk one that's fine right if you want to say something like all moral statements are false that's fine but you can't then say no no i'm just describing normal everyday morality because it's not the case that normal everyday morality uh, is only got false statements in, right? So an error theorist, if he helps himself to that one move, can't help himself to the other. But you want to say all morality is, is imposition, of, or all immorality is, is imposition of will. And whenever there's a weird consequence, and that means, well, you know, it must be some kind of revision of the normal concept. You're like, no, 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 it's basically just the normal concept, right? And I think that fundamentally that's, that's the thing that is jarring with me the most is that like, and anyway, if I push you down the revisionist route, you're selling me a bad apple. It feels like I just don't want it. Right. Like I don't see any, any benefit in your theory whatsoever. It just feels like you're just trying to sell me desire satisfaction instead of morality, just rebadging desire satisfaction as morality and just going, yeah, that's, those are the consequences, you know, <laughs> why do that? Okay, I'll be bad morality as being my left foot. Do you want to buy that product? Okay, so a few things there. One was the I don't know if I'm using a like a niche definition of intuition. I'm just using the one on Google. The ability to understand something without any conscious reasoning. So when I say intuitions of morality, it's just a feeling essentially. That's what I meant. I was not using a technical definition of philosophy. I was just using the colloquial definition of intuition in that context. Um, well, second, we were having a technical conversation about philosophy, and it's not settled by dictionaries. The the way I used the word was by the dictionary usage. If you didn't want to accept that, I mean, I that's what I meant by the word. It's just a straw man to try and impose a different definition on me. I, so I can't help you out. It's not a straw man because I said that your usage of the term being different from the philosophical kind of understanding is misleading when we're having a conversation like this. It's misleading to say, I'm, I mean whatever Google tells me and not what, like, I thought we were having a philosophical conversation. I mean, it's, it's I don't know. Okay, it's just a surprise to me. It's not exactly a significant issue there. It's just, you if you're using those words in ways that are not what the... Stand, I mean, lots of philosophy is just learning technical concepts and ways that people use words in specific ways, right? And if you're going to have a conversation like this, but just insist on using Google definitions for it, it makes it really hard to know what the other guy means throughout it. Um, I don't want to have to Google every philosophical concept to figure it out. I'd, I'd rather have, I'd rather know that you'd, you know, spoke that same language as me when we're having this conversation. So it's just difficult. It's not a straw man. It's just that I'm saying it's difficult to understand what you mean when you're not using, when you're using philosophical words, but having a different usage to them. It can't, it's not a straw man. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, so yeah, I was, when I just, lots of words people use in conversation, especially live conversations are just using the colloquial definitions. I mean, I would just use the principle of charity to try to interpret the most reasonable interpretation of what that could possibly mean. I mean, it sh I don't know. It shouldn't have been hard to realize. I was just talking about feelings that people have. I don't know why that was hard, but so, so 
when I talk about morality, I'm talking about the feelings we have when we see something. It's oh, it's that's we feel that that's moral or that's immoral. When we're talking about morality, that's what we're talking about. And so, if we look at those feelings and try to describe them, what do they mean? What are the patterns behind them? We get something like moral progress. We we can see that it's a potential explanation or a potential extrapolation from those feelings. And we we're trying to describe all of these things to create a model of morality to explain all of this stuff. And whatever that model is, that's what we mean by morality. So how do we explain these feelings? What are these feelings referring to? And so if these feelings refer to something differently in the future, it's still morality. It's not that we just change definitions. It's that the same feelings just refer to different things. Like at one point, we didn't have these moral feelings when killing animals. Now we do have these moral feelings when killing animals. It's not that we changed the meaning of the word morality. It's that morality is just that feeling. That is what morality is. And so I'm saying eventually we're going to have those same feelings towards rocks falling on people in the future. And and your argument that my model can't both describe the current system of morality and describe the future system of morality doesn't make any sense to me. It's like saying that, well, microevolution can't explain macroevolution. Like, of course it can. You just have to look at it from the, the perspective of where we are today and how we feel today and then where we will be in the future and how we will feel in the future. So I don't see any problem there. It's just, so my model describes how we feel today, uh, or attempts to, and then uses that to project into the future. Like, I agree, we do not feel this way about rocks today. I don't feel this way about rocks today. I'm just saying this is a consequence of the model and how we will feel in the future. So I don't see how that objection really applies to what I was saying. Um, and yeah, I'm not, I wasn't like, thinking about the philosophical definition of intuition, it was just the first word that popped into my head to explain moral feelings. I'm, I'm not sure, like, if I've got much left in me, it's quite late now. Um, I guess, I don't know. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe this, I think, I, so, your summary then was just, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if, if any of the points I've made uh, have made any impact with your perspective. So you don't think, your th I, you don't, so your theory is that involuntary imposition are immoral and that a consequence of that is that if a rock hits you on the head, that's immoral, but also you don't think that if a rock hits you in the head that that's immoral. That's not actually your currently your view. Is that what you just said? Well, no, it's it's logically I come to that conclusion, but it's not what I feel emotionally. So when I because when we talk about emo, emo, morality, we're talking about those feelings that we have. So I don't have that feeling when I see a rock. I think it's immoral, but I think that based off of how we define morality and how we're describing those feelings, that's going to be a consequence in the future. People are going to feel that way in the future once we once we get to that level of moral progress, which I think is a real thing. I mean, I still find that baffling. I mean, I don't know why. Yeah, I just, all I can understand from you saying there is that in the future, presumably as things get better in the future, right? Not like Mad Max future, but like, future, right? When there's nothing to worry about anymore. Yep, yep. Um, then all people will care about are those things like rocks hitting them on the head because everyone's cool with each other and they're not punching each other in the face anymore. Right. And it is. So if it comes to be that people stop doing things like punching each other in the face and they never impose on each other's will, right. If that happens, then what people will get annoyed about are things like rocks hitting them on the head instead, right. Things like nature doing stuff that they don't like. Right. And that would be the thing that they moan about, don't like, and the things that, you know, bug them, right? And that when that happens, that they will then use the word morality, like, to describe those things. Right? I, I just, I don't see any reason to think that, even if all those things come to pass, right? And we're in the Star Trek utopia, and no one's a dick to anyone anymore, right? That they would ever think of saying, oh, like my the enterprise is going past a supernova that's about to go off. Um, that's immoral. Like why? I, there's no reason to think that that would happen. I just it's a consequence of your view, but it's just one of the weird count like counterintuitive consequences of your view. 
But I don't think there's any reason to suppose that those Star Trek future versions of ourselves would embrace your view, right? It, it just, it, I don't know. I just, just it's bizarre. It, I, I feel like I understand it less than when we started talking. Um, I just feels like that's a weird prediction that you've made on top of the weird definition that you've come up with. It's not a weird definition, but it has weird consequences. I mean, I can see the intuitive, I can see the intuition, right, that like freedom is good, Um, lack of freedom is bad. I can understand that intuition. I'd rather have more freedom than less if I, you know, had to pick or something. But it just feels like um, what I would prefer, like I said before, what I would prefer is to not pay for the bit, right? That would be better. That's what I want. But it's not morally better. There's no reason to think that what uh, what aligns with my preferences or desires or whatever is always going to guarantee that that's tracking. That's just an algorithm that tells you what's morally good and what's morally bad. Morally good things, morally bad things are independent of that. They're independent of your desire. On a, on my view, on a realist view, I would have thought any realist view ultimately has to try and say that what's good and what's bad doesn't depend on my desires right depend it doesn't depend on me in any way if it's good you know for x to happen then regardless of my attitude towards that it's going to be good or bad right it's going to have the same truth value if i want it to happen or if i don't want it to happen once you start saying that you know it depends on my attitudes that just feels to me like it's a species of subjectivism right if you want it to be objective and i'm i'm down with objective morality i think that's that's a reasonable way to go right um you know shrug off this in fact it seems to me honestly i'm not trying to and it's not an insult to you but it's a juvenile way of looking at this to suppose that um morality matches perfectly um what i want to, to be the world what the way that i w- want the world to be and the way that the world should be are just the same i think that's a juvenile way of looking at things um and the two things come apart. It's part of being an adult, it seems to me, to understand that those two things are different to each other. Um, but it seems like a consequence of your view that they're the same thing. It, just, that's what, it feels like that's what your view is. Um, so anyway, I've said, I think I've said about all I can say. It's getting late. So um, it, unless you want to talk about one or two other little things, I think we should just call it a night if that's okay. Me there. Can't hear you if you are there. Yeah. So, um, uh, I think, yeah, I can just summarize my position, and then we can just call it a night. I think that's sounds fair. So, when I talk about morality, I'm talking about the feelings we have of morality, and when we look at the feelings we have, they seem to follow the pattern that it's describing essentially our wants and desires, and I think that there is. A definition of morality which is objective to that it's not contingent on the desires it's just that it would be better if we could all have our desires fulfilled or something and that that principle is independent of the desires themselves and so there is an objective morality which is it would be better if we could all have our desires fulfilled and not have to suffer involuntary impositions of will and that's what our moral intuitions or the feelings of morality have kind of indicate and as we progress technologically and get rid of every single instance of involuntary imposition, we're eventually going to see things like rocks falling on us as being immoral because it happened against our will. Like if a supernova happened and it killed a bunch of people, we would see that as immoral in the future at some time. And that's a prediction I'm making. We don't feel it now, obviously. And if it comes true, well, then we'll know I was right. Um, so essentially, that's just my interpretation of it. Um, but I think that's just a good place to stop. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you having the conversation with me. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Okay, cool. All right. I'll see you later. All right. Well, thank you guys. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming by for the um, conversation. Um, oh, and they're gone. I was going to try to get T-Jump to answer a few questions there, but I guess that's it. <laughs>